Judith Carter Henry was born in 1777, but she lived long enough to see the very beginning of the American Civil War, which broke out when she was 85. She was an invalid, living in her house with her 56-year-old son and 54-year-old daughter, as well as a slave named Lucy who was owned by a neighbor and hired by Miss Henry. Prior to the fighting at Bull Run, Miss Henry's children wanted to move her. She wouldn't hear of it at first, but when Union shells started to go off around her house, she changed her mind. Together, with the help of Lucy, they put their mother on a mattress and tried to carry her out of the house, but they had waited too long to move her, and now, while the three of them were carrying Miss Henry out on her mattress to the home of a reverend a mile away, they were facing cannon fire all around them. Terrified, Miss Henry begged to be taken back to her home. Shortly after their return to the Henry house, a Union shell burst through her roof and exploded next to Miss Henry. The bed she was lying on was destroyed, and the old woman was thrown onto the floor. One of her feet was gone. Lucy was also hit. Miss Henry's daughter, Ellen, hid in the chimney, where she was safe from the explosions, but not from the sounds echoing around her, rendering her permanently deaf. Lucy would survive, but Miss Henry would not. Judith Henry was the only civilian killed during the first battle of Bull Run. When the battle was over, her children buried her in her garden, which was now destroyed by the battle that took place around her house. I'm Chris Calton, and this is the Mises Institute podcast, Historical Controversies. In the previous episode, we learned about the first part of the battle, in which the Union claimed victory around noon after driving the Confederacy off Matthews Hill. What they did not realize at the time was that the Confederates would regroup and continue to fight back on the nearby Henry Hill, where Judith Henry's house sat. Also, before I get into today's episode, I want to remind everybody again that we will be doing a live Q&A on August 6th at 2 p.m. Eastern to mark the one-year anniversary of the show. So if you have any questions you would like me to answer, please submit them to Mises.org slash Q&A. If you aren't able to watch live, you'll be able to find it later on YouTube as well. With the Confederates retreating from Matthews Hill to Henry Hill just before noon, it looked like a Union victory, and many people started celebrating prematurely. But what McDowell was not yet aware of was that the retreating Confederates weren't the only ones setting up on Henry Hill. There were more fresh Confederate soldiers on their way. The Legion, led by Wade Hampton III and the brigade under the command of Thomas Jackson, had been en route since earlier that morning, and as their comrades were retreating, they were nearing the battlefield. I detailed Beauregard's plan in the previous episode, which was to attack from the Confederate right, and Beauregard was hesitant to abandon his plans, only finding out at around 10.30 that his orders to Richard Ewell to initiate the attack had never been delivered. Joseph Johnston was less dedicated to Beauregard's plan, and when he learned that combat was heating up on the Confederate left, he told Beauregard that he was going to head that way, and by 11 a.m., Beauregard finally seemed to accept that he needed to do the same. But as reinforcements were still making their way to Henry Hill, John Imboden was holding the position by the skin of his teeth with his four small cannons. Finally, the first set of fresh troops arrived to help him out, Wade Hampton's 600-man legion from South Carolina. When Hampton rode up, the scene was chaos. The Confederate forces were in disarray. A cannonball landed just underneath his horse, harmlessly, but caking him in mud. He moved his men forward to support the retreating Georgians. I mentioned in the previous episode that Wade Hampton III was the wealthiest planter in all of the South, owning nearly 3,000 slaves. He wasn't a fire eater by any means, and he had grown rather disillusioned with slavery, but he supported his state and secession. And when the Confederacy formed, he donated a ton of cotton to Jefferson Davis to raise money for the Confederacy, and he volunteered to raise a legion that he would arm out of his own pocket. This was the Hampton Legion now joining the fight. The Hampton Legion came upon Henry Hill around the northeastern side, where the Robinson House sat. They climbed over the fence, taking Union bullets as they did. They could see Imboden's artillery to their left, still giving the Yankees everything they had with their small, smooth-bore cannons. As the men moved, they constantly ducked or dove to the ground, instinctively trying to avoid being hit, futile as it must have been. One officer wrote, quote, I suppose they thought the dodging was a help. We could never keep orderly ranks so long as the men persisted in dodging. End quote. The Union moved in on Imboden's artillery as well, but the smoothbore cannons at that close range could be devastating. One New Yorker witnessed his friend go down, writing about it later, quote, 
Here I saw the first man killed. Private Wesley Randall of Binghamton, who was marching just in front of me, was struck with a grape shot over the left eye. He gave an unearthly screech and, leaping into the air, came down on his hands and knees and straightened out dead. End quote. They were part of the 27th New York Regiment, and they faced both the close-range artillery as well as musket fire as they tried to close the gap to Henry Hill. They were decimated. One soldier described the bullets flying everywhere as sounding like a quote-unquote cloud of mosquitoes. When Hampton's Legion, accompanied by some of the Alabamians and Mississippians from Matthews Hill, ran into the 27th New York, the New Yorkers didn't know if they were facing friend or foe. Both sides were wearing gray uniforms. One New Yorker asked, What regiment are you? In response, a Confederate waving a white handkerchief suggested that the New Yorkers surrender. But before an answer was given, the Confederates unleashed a volley of close-range musket fire, and the New Yorkers, who didn't go down, returned in kind. One of the New Yorkers rushed at the handkerchief waving Confederate and put his bayonet through him. With this, wholesale fighting broke out between the two groups. Hampton's horse was killed. Hampton's subordinate officer, Benjamin Johnson, took a bullet through his skull. The New Yorkers gave as good as they got, but they lost too many men and finally retreated. As they were leaving, their commander, H.W. Slocum, was hit, though he would survive. To the left of the Hampton Legion, Embedin was losing hold on his position, though. He was almost out of ammunition, and several of the horses that pulled his guns had been killed. With his ammo depleting, he would have to retreat soon, and it would be better to do it now before more of his horses were killed. As he was moving back, one Union shell broke the will off one of his gun's carriage. Embedin had to leave it behind, knowing it would probably be captured by the Yankees. One of McDowell's subordinate officers, Colonel William Averell, saw the Confederates rallying on Henry Hill and wanted to stop them before they could regroup. He gathered two regiments, the 8th New York and the 14th Brooklyn, and led them toward Henry Hill. But as they started climbing Henry Hill, their organization fell apart. Somebody started leading the 8th New York in the wrong direction, where they ran into Hampton's Legion, who quickly scattered them. The 14th Brooklyn moved in a different direction and ran into the 71st New York, who mistook them for Confederates and fired on them. Averell's charge fell apart in the space between Matthews Hill and Henry Hill, which was now anybody's territory. Neither side had solid control of it. The Hampton Legion was not able to gain any ground for the Confederacy, but they did prove crucial for the Confederates' ability to maintain their position on Henry Hill. This bought them just enough time to let Thomas Jackson lead his 2,600-man brigade to vastly strengthen the Confederate hold. Jackson arrived around noon. As Jackson's men climbed the hill, they passed retreating Confederates. The news they received was not optimistic. Jackson's men asked how the battle was going, and many of the soldiers told him that they'd already lost. We are whipped, one of the retreating Confederates said. The enemy is in overwhelming numbers, and our men are in full retreat. One of Jackson's men expressed the discouragement felt after receiving this news, quote, Such talk was very inspiring to our troops. It was calculated to make a boy wish himself a thousand miles away and in the trundle bed at his mother's house. End quote. When Jackson passed Barnard B., he received similarly discouraging news. General, they are driving us, B. said to Jackson. But Jackson gave a now famous response, quote, Sir, we will give them the bayonet. Jackson also ran into Imboden with his retreating artillery. Imboden was angry at having been left alone on Henry Hill for so long, and he unleashed a flurry of profanity, which the highly religious Jackson did not appreciate. But he let Imboden vent and then promised that he would support his artillery and told him to unload his guns where they stood. Imboden resisted. He had only three shells left and he needed to fall back to resupply. But Jackson insisted, saying that the appearance of the cannons, even if they were empty, would give the impression that the Confederates had a stronger defense and this would give the Yankees pause. Imboden reluctantly complied. Jackson set up his defenses on the southeastern edge of Henry Hill. He'd been an artillery instructor at the Virginia Military Institute, and there's no doubt that he eyed the terrain for the best defensive position. If the Confederates lost Henry Hill, the path to Manassas Junction would be open for the Union Army, but Jackson picked a good spot. The position provided good cover for his infantry, and it allowed the artillery to be aimed at a 300-yard stretch of land that the Union soldiers would have to expose themselves to in order to charge his position. Keep in mind that Jackson had two cannons of his own, so even though Imboden's three remaining guns were useless for the time being, they weren't without functioning cannons at all. 
As Jackson was positioning his men, Johnston and Beauregard arrived. As they traveled, they picked up 13 more cannons, and they immediately set them in place of Imboden's ornamental guns, finally freeing him to fetch more ammunition. Before he left, Imboden fired off the last round he had, personally loading the cannon, only to have it discharged prematurely, sending Imboden flying 20 feet and rendering him permanently deaf in one ear. Jackson also brought in Jeb Stuart and his 300 cavalry and ordered them to protect his flank. Stuart divided his force in half, sending one half to Jackson's right and the other half to Jackson's left. The two commanding generals also ran into some of the troops who'd been devastated on Matthews Hill. Johnston came upon some of the remaining soldiers from the 4th Alabama. This regiment, by some accounts, suffered the highest casualty rate of any regiment on either side during the battle. Johnston rode to the Alabamian carrying the regiment's flag and reached for it. The color bearer snatched the flag away, saying, quote, Don't take them from me, General. Just tell me where you wish them taken, and I will carry them. End quote. While Johnston was positioning the Alabamians, Beauregard was inspiring a group of Louisianans. As he was giving them words of encouragement, a Union shell exploded beneath his horse, ripping its guts out. The horse falling dead to the ground, Beauregard calmly dismounted, called for another horse, and rode off. As sad as the image might be for the poor, disemboweled horse, Beauregard's calm response had an incredibly encouraging effect on the witnesses. One man of the Hamptons Legion later wrote, quote, I cannot describe to you the effect of Beauregard's appearance. Indeed, all was changed in a moment. The men brightened up, dressed to their ranks, and gave him a rousing cheer. End quote. Between Hampton's Legion, Jackson's Brigade, and Johnston and Beauregard's presence, the Confederate troops were suddenly in a much better position. They were ready to fight again, but while the Confederates had been preparing their defenses on Henry Hill, General McDowell was a mile away, struggling to decide his next move. He certainly wasn't aware of the full status of the Confederate position, but there's no doubt he saw the cannons being moved into position and several Confederate troops arriving as reinforcements. He knew that despite the early celebrations, the battle was not yet won. But he was receiving reinforcements of his own. The brigades in Tyler's division, led by Sherman and Keyes, had crossed Bull Run, and the fresh soldiers were now at his disposal. Even with devastation suffered by some of the Union regiments on Matthews Hill, McDowell now had upwards of 15,000 fighting men behind him. But he was indecisive. Some soldiers would describe a lull in the battle between noon and 2 p.m. This was McDowell trying to decide on his next course of action, and then finally moving his forces into position once he decided on a plan. But the two-hour lull gave the Confederates time to set their position on Henry Hill, and for people looking back on the battle, this would be considered one of McDowell's mistakes. As the Union soldiers waited for McDowell to give them orders, the euphoria over their apparent victory started to give way to impatience. The lull, just to be clear, was not a complete cessation of fighting between noon and two o'clock. It was just that the fighting had slowed to only sporadic, small-scale combat here and there. The artillerists on both sides continued firing their cannons at the enemy. While Jackson was setting the men up on Henry Hill, Erasmus Keyes was moving his Union Brigade into position as well. His men moved to the northern edge of Henry Hill, near the Robinson House. They arrived sometime before two o'clock, and Keyes was under orders to take care of the Confederate battery that Jackson was setting up. The Confederate guns were pointing northwest toward the Union forces on Dogan Ridge, so Keyes' force from the north were attempting to flank them. They came across Jeb Stewart's cavalrymen protecting the Confederate right flank, but they quickly scattered. Cavalry at this point were mostly useful in chasing retreating soldiers, but they were very ineffective at head-on combat against gun-toting infantry. Their next barricade was Hampton's Legion, who opened fire on the approaching Yankees. Keyes told his men to hit the deck, and the two forces swapped musket fire. But Hampton quickly realized that the Yankees greatly outnumbered them, and he ordered his men to fall back. As they were retreating, carrying their wounded with them, they periodically turned around and fired on the Yankees. One of the South Carolinians, Charles Hudson, took a bullet to the forehead, but he must have been at a respectable distance because it didn't pierce his skull. With blood pouring into his eyes, he tried to reload his weapon and fire back, but he couldn't clear his vision. He finally started to retreat again, only to have another bullet hit his rifle, destroying it. But he made it out of harm's way and survived getting shot in the forehead. Keyes led his men further up Henry Hill, and the next group of Confederates they ran into were mistaken for Union soldiers. The Confederates weren't sure if they were facing friends or foes either, but when the Yankees kept moving up the hill, they figured this must be the enemy, and they let loose a volley of musket fire that took out several of Keyes' men. 
Still, the Union soldiers advanced. Fighting broke out over the Robinson house, with soldiers using it for cover and each side trying to claim it. Keyes had the advantage and the Confederates were trapped. But one Union soldier believed this only spurred the Southerners to fight back more fiercely. He wrote, quote, They knew they had to fight or die. And so they went at it. And I tell you, they will fight when you get them pinned. End quote. He wasn't wrong. The Confederates fought back hard enough that Keyes, seeing his men dropping around him, ordered the retreat back down the hill. He failed to take Jackson's right flank, and when he set up at the base of the hill, he would not attack again. To many of the soldiers, war was starting to lose its romance. One of Keyes' men wrote, quote, We begin to think a battle is not so nice as some had imagined. End quote. At two o'clock, McDowell finally decided on what to do and gave his orders. He gave instructions to his chief of artillery, William Barry, and told him to move two batteries to Henry Hill. He gave no orders to support the artillery with infantry. His plan was to move the artillery to within only a few hundred yards of the enemy and unleash a flurry of cannon fire at close range. This was similar to Hunter's move earlier in the day, if you remember from the previous episode, and it was a distinctly Napoleonic tactic, but it was effective in the days of smoothbore muskets and smoothbore cannons. McDowell was trying this strategy with rifled cannons facing rifled muskets, both guns having much greater range than their smoothbore counterparts, meaning that the artillerists would be needlessly exposing themselves to gunfire in order to man the cannons that would still have been useful at a much safer distance. This would prove to arguably be the biggest battlefield mistake of the day. Barry forwarded the orders to two artillery company commanders, Captain Charles Griffin and Captain James Ricketts, each of whom manned a six-gun company, though one of the guns was out of commission at this point. Neither man were happy with the orders, immediately seeing the danger they'd be exposing their men to, especially without infantry support. Even though McDowell gave no instructions to send infantry in with the artillery, Major Barry recognized the need to do this, so he gathered up five regiments to protect the cannons. As one of the soldiers said of this, quote, Would that the pet lambs were led to slaughter, end quote. Even with the infantry support, Griffin protested his orders. He wanted to let the infantry take position ahead of the battery, but Barry wouldn't allow it. The artillery would take position on Henry Hill, and the infantry would support them from the rear. Griffin said that there was no way that the infantry would support them, but he followed his orders, albeit reluctantly. Now let me say, before I continue the story, that the next couple of hours are the haziest of the entire battle. Records left behind by participants constantly contradict each other, so historians still have disagreement on what actually happened, and I'm going to tell the story as accurately as I can, trying to focus on the things we can know with some degree of certainty, but there's definitely debate and disagreement over the events between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock p.m., so some of the sources that I'm using offer very different chronologies of the events that are about to follow. According to historian John Hennessy, Ricketts' battery arrived first, though the timing here is also a matter of dispute. But when he set his cannons in position, his leftmost cannon was maybe 60 yards away from the Henry House, which was now full of Confederates. They unloaded on Ricketts, taking out men and horses with their first volley. Ricketts turned his cannons toward the house and sent off the shell that would kill Judith Henry, as I described in the opening anecdote. The Confederates inside fled to higher ground. With the house clear, Ricketts aimed his guns back at Jackson's line up the hill, roughly 350 yards in front of him. Griffin's guns arrived on Ricketts' left, about 400 yards away from the Confederate line. But as soon as Griffin opened fire, the error in attempting this antiquated Napoleonic strategy became clear. Before moving, Griffin had been firing his cannons at a safe distance from the Dogan Ridge out of range of the Confederate muskets. Now his men were exposed and they suffered for it. The Confederates, being higher up on the hill and protected by trees, were less vulnerable. Coming up behind the artillery were the infantry regiments Barry sent forward. They set up behind the cannons, and for the next 20 minutes, the cannons from both armies pounded each other. This demonstrated another problem with the Napoleonic close-range artillery charge. The Confederates had more of the short-range smoothbore cannons that could not match the range of the rifled cannons commanded by the Yankees. By moving close enough to be within range of the smoothbores, the Union soldiers had effectively increased the number of Confederate cannons that could fire on them. But both sides took losses. One Union soldier, according to a witness, had just said, quote, Those cannonballs are flying pretty thick, end quote. One of the cannonballs bounced off the ground and knocked his head off. 
and the witnesses watched his headless body slump to the ground. On the other side, two members of the 4th Virginia Regiment, who'd been friends since childhood, were killed by the same cannonball. But while his soldiers were holding their position, Thomas Jackson was riding his horse through the lines of soldiers, nursing a wound on his finger from an earlier Union bullet and encouraging his troops to hold steady. It had the desired effect on the men. One soldier wrote, quote, He seems to be very quiet, so we think that all is all right, and that this is like battles generally, end quote. Jackson gave instructions for his men to wait until the enemy was only 50 yards away and then conduct a bayonet charge. At around 3 o'clock, the Union infantry started to advance up the hill. As they moved, they faced canister shot from the Confederate guns, this being the far more devastating replacement to grape shot. They gave a 16-foot spread of 27 projectiles when the ball exploded, making it the most destructive type of cannon fire that infantry could face until the advent of shrapnel shells in 1864. But the troops pushed forward, encouraged by the division commander, Samuel Heinzelman, who helped Barry gather the infantry for battery support, and his aide, Colonel Averell. As the soldiers moved forward, Averell spotted a group of soldiers about 100 yards away. They were dressed in civilian clothes, and Averell and Heinzelman weren't sure whose side they were on. One of the Union soldiers was more certain. Dim is successors, he said. He was German and his English was poor, but his regiment commander, Willis Gorman, thought otherwise. He believed he spotted the United States flag and told his men that they were friends. Finally, after the two regiments stared each other down, one man riding a horse approached one of the Union officers, Captain Alexander Wilkin, and asked what regiment they were. Instead of answering, Wilkin asked what regiment the other soldier was, and the stranger answered, the second Mississippi. Wilkins then asked the man to dismount, as he was now their prisoner. He was the 2nd Mississippi's Lieutenant Colonel Bartley Barry Boone. Heinzelman was in front of a different Union regiment, the Fire Zwaves from the 11th New York, and they were facing a different group of Confederates, the 33rd Virginia. Heinzelman ordered the Zwaves to charge, and the Virginians let loose a mostly ineffective volley of musket fire. As was common, the soldiers aimed too high, but now the different regiments descended into close-range combat. There were so many guns going off in this short area on Henry Hill that the soldiers couldn't even see through the smoke. Dozens of men fell on both sides. While this was taking place, Ricketts' battery was being massacred by the Confederates. As both men and horses started to litter the battlefield, the Union soldiers started to scatter. The officers tried to keep their men in place and maintain order, but it was no good. The battlefield was chaos. To the Union right, Jeb Stuart's other set of 150 cavalry came upon some of the disorganized Union soldiers and mistook them for fleeing Confederates. Stuart, wanting to encourage them to stand and fight, rode up to them and said, quote, Don't run, boys, we are here. But the Union soldiers ignored him and kept running. Then Stuart saw a U.S. flag being carried by one of the men and realized that he was encouraging the wrong set of troops, so he rode back to his men and ordered them to charge. It took only a few seconds for the Confederate cavalry to close the distance to the Union soldiers. The mounted Confederates fired on the Yankees, but their aim was poor. Some of the men on the ground tried to turn around and return fire, claiming a number of Stuart's men and horses. But with better aim, the Confederates returned in kind. One cavalryman tried to get his horse to jump over the Union line that had formed to respond to them, but the horse fell short and hit one Union soldier in the chest, knocking him to the ground. Then... To quote from the writer's own testimony, quote, I leaned down in the saddle, rammed the muzzle of my carbine into the stomach of my man, and pulled the trigger. I could not help feeling a little sorry for the fellow as he lifted his handsome face to mine while he tried to get his bayonet up to meet me. But he was too slow, for the carbine blew a hole as big as my arm clear through him. End quote. With the Union line scattered, Stuart ordered his men to fall back to continue protecting Jackson's left flank. With the pressure on Henry Hill, Johnston started sending more reinforcements. The 6th Carolina had recently arrived at Manassas Junction. Johnston's army would continue arriving throughout the battle, and the general immediately ordered them to receive orders from Beauregard on Henry Hill. Then he gathered up three more companies of troops from various positions around the larger battlefield and sent them to the hill as well. Having had some time to rest, and with the battle heating up on Henry Hill, some of the troops who'd faced combat on Matthews Hill started to rejoin the fighting. Colonel Bartow started to lead his Georgian regiments back to the fight, and the able-bodied troops remaining from the Mississippi, South Carolina, and Alabama regiments from the morning combat formed makeshift regiments and rejoined as well. 
Barnard B. also wanted to join the fight, and he found a body of troops standing idle. He rode up to them and asked, What regiment is this? One soldier responded, Why, General, don't you know your own men? This is what is left of the 4th Alabama. B. responded again, This is all of my brigade that I can find. Will you follow me back to where the fighting is going on? The soldier answered, Yes, General, we will go wherever you lead and do whatever you say. Then B. created a legend. He pointed to Jackson's line and said, Yonder stands Jackson like a stone wall. Let's go to his assistance. Now, let me digress here briefly and throw a little bit of cold water on the Stonewall Jackson legend. Don't get me wrong. In terms of military capability, Jackson proved himself to be a fine general, and his performance at Bull Run is an example of his ability, I think. But the legend, like all legends, has a great deal of mythology around it as well. For one thing, the accuracy of the quote is a matter of historical question. The story of Barnard B's comparing Jackson to a stone wall was first printed in the Charleston Mercury. B was a South Carolinian, and the article was written to honor B, not Jackson. B would actually be killed in combat shortly after this story took place. Some people actually contested the accuracy of the quote on two accounts. At least one person claims that the stone wall comparison actually came from Joseph Johnston, and it was appropriated by the author of the article in order to glorify B in South Carolina. Another account from one of B's men claimed that B was not praising Jackson, but was actually criticizing him, standing stubbornly like a stone wall. We don't know which of these three accounts is true, but I do find the original legend-making account to be the most plausible. For Johnston, there seems to be enough witnesses corroborating the fact that B did actually say it, including the guy who claimed that it was not a compliment. And regarding that guy, it seems likely that he could have interpreted it that way because he personally was not eager to rejoin combat. But B was pugnacious and eager to join the battle. If you remember from the previous episode, he was disappointed at the prospect of not participating in the battle. And Jackson's line was now holding the Confederate position on Henry Hill, so it seems unlikely that B would have thought he should retreat. So whatever journalistic flourishes may have been added, the legendary account does strike me as more plausible than the alternative accounts. But because B died, he was not available to confirm what he actually said, and the truth will always be a matter of some conjecture. A few days after the Charleston Mercury printed this article, a Richmond paper picked up the story and adapted it to one praising Jackson. Both papers were trying to praise a native son, B, the South Carolinian, and Jackson, the Virginian. After Bull Run, there wasn't a clear Virginian for Richmond papers to point to. Robert E. Lee was basically shuffling paperwork for the Confederate Army at this point, and Joseph Johnston did not have any clearly glorifiable anecdote in the battle. So the story of Jackson gave Virginia a hero of their own. But while Jackson composed himself admirably during the battle, holding his line and encouraging his troops while he was under fire, he wasn't considered to be doing anything particularly exceptional. After Bull Run, when Beauregard and Johnston gave their accounts of subordinate officers who deserved specific praise, they named Nathan Evans, the guy who took action on Matthews Hill, Wade Hampton for his efforts in holding Henry Hill while Jackson's brigade arrived, and then Arnold Elsey, whose role in the battle would come later. But Jackson's role was not considered nearly as crucial as theirs was at the time. And although he executed his job well, he really did exactly what officers were trained to do. Jackson's encouragement to his men under fire was literally textbook military leadership at the time. It is exactly what officers were taught to do to have the precise effect it had. So modern readers look at this and see it as him acting exceptionally, but from the perspectives of people like Johnston or Beauregard, it was simply Jackson acting as an officer was expected to act. Now, I don't say any of this to diminish Jackson's ability as an officer. Much of his reputation would be earned in later battles, and he would prove himself quite well by almost any account. And he obviously performed his duties quite well at Bull Run as well, and I think there is an argument to be made that Jackson's leadership in forming the defensive line and setting artillery on Henry Hill may have been undervalued by Beauregard and Johnston at the time. Those are arguments that can be made, but I'm not very interested in all of that. I mostly want to offer this digression in order to separate the fact from the fiction since the legend of Stonewall Jackson has grown into something so much more than it was immediately after Bull Run in the eyes of the people at the time. But regardless of all this, within days of the publication of B's statement, the nickname Stonewall Jackson 
would be adopted. And even if Jackson did not earn the same level of fame as some of the other officers present, he would earn greater fame than probably any other Confederate officer aside from Robert E. Lee. But B led his group of Alabamians to Henry Hill to rejoin the battle. And as he was crossing the yard of the Henry house, he was knocked off his horse when a mini ball hit him in the groin. His men carried him off the field where he lingered until the next day. The Confederate fire against the Union artillery was intense. And at this point in the battle, so many horses were dead that the cannons and Ricketts battery were immobile. One of Griffin's subordinates suggested they withdraw, but Griffin refused. He knew that if he withdrew his forces, Ricketts would be slaughtered. Instead, he came up with a plan. Griffin was going to leave the three guns he had around the Henry house in place, and he would lead two 12-pound howitzers around Ricketts' battery to put pressure on the Confederate left. He knew it was a reckless move, but it might be the only hope of taking the hill. But as Griffin was moving the howitzers, more Confederate troops showed up and reported to Beauregard for orders. This was the 450 men in the 49th Virginia, led by former Virginia governor William Smith. Beauregard sent them to extend Jackson's left flank. As he was moving, Smith's horse took a bullet, forcing him to dismount and lead his men the rest of the way on foot, giving them an encouraging speech as they marched. As they approached to their position, the newly arrived howitzers from Griffin came into view. Smith told his men to hold their fire until they had the enemy in sight because he believed that the Union forces had not yet spotted them. In fact, Griffin's men had indeed spotted Confederates, and Griffin's ordered the howitzers to be loaded with canister. The cannoneers loaded the cannons and aimed them toward the Confederates, but right as they were to fire the devastating shots, a voice yelled out, Captain, don't fire! It was Major William Barry. Those are your battery supports, Barry said. Griffin did not agree. He argued back, quote, They are Confederates. As certain as the world, they are Confederates, end quote. Barry reassured him, I know they are your battery support, he said. Griffin was still not convinced, but Barry was his superior officer, so he acquiesced. His men started re-aiming his guns at Jackson's line, pointing them away from Smith's Virginians. But as Griffin watched the Virginians moving toward them, he grew even more nervous, so he finally ordered his guns to be taken off the field. He was too late. The Confederates raised their muskets and let loose a terrible volley, taking out several Union men. Then, yelling like savages, to quote one Union soldier, the Confederates charged. Griffin's men were effectively defenseless at this point, and his men scattered, leaving the howitzers behind to be captured by the enemy. Historians have identified this moment as the turning point of the battle when the Confederates finally had the upper hand. For the Confederates, the battle made a complete 180, but it wasn't won yet. With the Union batteries sitting immobile between Matthews and Henry Hills, the combat would reach its highest point in the next couple of hours, in which the greatest number of casualties would be seen as both sides struggled for control of the valuable artillery. We will pick up the story here in the next episode. Historical Controversies is a production of the Ludwig von Mises Institute. If you would like to support the show, please subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher and leave a positive review. You can also support the show financially by donating at mises.org slash support HC. If you would like to explore the rest of our content, please visit mises.org. That's M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G. -E